Before we get to chatting, I'm just going to pray us in. Lord, uh, be with us on this discussion, wherever these topics may lead. Be with us and guide our emotions, guide our thoughts, guide our ability to conversate, Lord. Help us be great men through this conversation and help us to inspire millions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Lage. Well, we're looking good here. I just got this here in case I got to fat and check you, you know, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're the human fact checker. So. Hey, I'm a hunting guide, not a raft guide. Well, well said. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to all you raft guides out there. <laughs> I apologize. I work with a lot. They they're a bit far fetched, and you know what they say. They're good at spinning yarns. Spinning yarns, I love it. I don't ever really hear people in the states ever say spinning yarns. Who do you? Who, where did you pick up that term? Probably from one of the books I've read. Really? Yeah, doing one right now about the. <clears throat> In particular, the 8th Air Force, but the 9th, the 15th. Um, it's the mastery of the air in Europe <clears throat> in World War II. So, um, and, you know, part of that was <clears throat> um, the British and their part. So, you know, I got a little British Commonwealth what, what, what language you, in me. Why did you decide to read this book? Because I love World War II history, I love history, I love naval history, and... And you're just like, in the library, and you saw this book. And you're like, I no, this is not an audio book. Mm. So I'm 14 hours in, 11 hours to go. Wow, this is a long audio it's a long book. book. Oh my god. I did one earlier in the year by James Hornfisher about the U.S. Navy during the first 10 years of the Cold War. And that was a long book. He's this book, book is by Donald Miller. So, love history. When are you getting your your book, audio book time in? Commuting. Car. So, yeah, in the car, driving to work. Yeah. Um, you know, work at Ski Cooper Man, I've nine months out of the year. So, and it's... 30 minute drive or something like it's that. It's 45 in the summer and an hour to an hour and 15 in the winter. Yeah, you can get a good amount of a book in every day then. It's approximately two hours a day. It's like productive, you know. Uh, when I have long drives, that's when I do the audiobooks too. And some of them that I've listened to this year, I had an eight-hour drive this year, and I was listening to Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights. And it, it's, it was so good. He, he narrates it so well. I'm like eight hours into this drive, and I'm like where I need to be, and the book's not over. And I didn't even want to quit driving because I was enjoying it. Yeah. Not every book I've ever listened to no, is like No, there's that. some losers. <laughs> some of them are like, all right, I better go to music for a little bit. Yeah. Kind of put me to sleep. Mm-hmm. Which is good for driving across the country, too. Or learning about stuff you want to know about. Yeah, yeah, you know, so. It's just like being able to weed through and finding the good stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know? Sometimes the samples aren't the best. No, because all the samples are the first five minutes of the book. Yeah. And a lot, of, it's, a lot of times it's the introduction or the thank you to my publisher and my family. And it's like, yeah, you know, you can't get your book in the first five minutes. I know, it's tough. So. I, think that, I think the guy reading it has a lot to do with it, too. Well, the narrator... It's huge. Cause it's, it's huge. I, I, I'm a big um, Kyle, Vince Flynn, Kyle Mills, Mitch Rapp series. So in between all my history books, I love like bang, bang, boom, action, thriller, Wait. CIA, good guy versus bad guy. You know, just, just you listen good. listen to those books too? Yeah. And for the entire series, there's been one narrator and he's so good. And the latest book didn't have this narrator and the book was a dud. Not because it was written bad or it wasn't interesting, it just 
it wasn't the same George Guadel. And it's like, no, George Guadel is Mitch Rapp. Yeah. <laughs> so, Just how he told the story. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, do I want to continue on with this narrator? <clears throat> Man, when I was filming with Laramie and we were tra we were we were driving all a lot of places and Laramie used to listen to this book on tape and it was it was there was a bunch of series to it and uh, I think it was called Smoke Jensen and I can still hear it whatever audio book soundtrack I mean we listen to it all the time and it was a western oh, yeah. and it was about like this western character and he'd go in and like it, it reminded me a lot of like a Louis L'Amour book mm -hmm. but different Mm -hmm. But he would talk about a lot of places we knew, like the yeah. Sangre de Cristos. Mm -hmm. He would talk about being there and like yeah. how they were all outlaw hideouts. Like yeah. they're really, yeah. really good stories, mm -hmm. purely fictional. Mm -hmm. But he was using places that we knew and that that we were hunting. Yeah. So it was like exciting because it was cowboy, right? Yeah. He'd you know sneak in like an Indian to these camps and shoot up all the bad guys. We listened to him all the time. Yeah. It was like you wanted to listen to him, like, hey, man, put on some smoke, Jensen. Yeah, then, not, not this year. Last year I, I drove because <clears throat> my mom's health was failing, and I was down going to Texas like once every six to eight weeks. And one of those trips I did the entire drive down and back <clears throat> to mom and dad's was Larry McMurtry's lonesome dove and to get to where i grew up i have to drive through archer city which is where larry mcmurtry is from and it's really cool in but it's the same thing you know driving from the front range of colorado all, down into texas that's the lonesome dove travel route you know the honest the yeah. up in the panhandle the comanche raids out in the brazos river not far from where i grew Ogallala, up right that's, uh, well that, that's, that's the cattle way. that's part of the route but the when gus is going after um blue duck yeah. You know, they're up in the Purgatory River of Colorado. And then after they make it to Montana, to the Milk River. And the, it's really, um, I think, Streets of Laredo, where that's they, the, they, they that's come the down. One, right? Yeah, and it's the, where um, Captain Call brings um, Gus. Gus's body back. I think that's in Lonesome Dove. Yeah, what, um, it, it it's at the tail end of Lonesome Dove. It's like part or part four or something. Yeah, and it's a little bit. I think, if I remember correct, in Streets of Laredo, they come down through the front, the Rocky Mountain front, and then the Front Range of Colorado again. But um, in in just the spinning the yarn, you know, of like Good Night, you know, Charles Good Night is in Streets of Laredo. Oh. Uh, a lot. He's mentioned in Lonesome Dove, but he's not one of the characters. I read Streets of Laredo. Um, that was like one of the only Lonesome Dove series books that I read. I try to read Lonesome Dove, but I've watched that oh. movie so many times. Oh, you know, the, the, it's a great. I love the movie, but the book just yeah. having grown up in Texas, it's just the book is like it. Just you know, I I, I the know audio where book this, or the book. The audiobook, but I have on my shelf. I have the hard copy. I saw, I saw it up there. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I like the movie Return to Lonesome Dove. Mm -hmm. Have you seen I've, that one? I, I think I've seen part of it. It's good. It's been a long time. It's a different. It's a different Captain McCall, though. Yeah. It just. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the original Gus and Call, like man, they. <clears throat> yeah. They nailed it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like. Um, uh, Tombstone, um, Doc Holliday. Yeah. That's, uh, what's his name? Oh, who Doc Holliday. It um, starts with a V. Yeah. Uh, well, Val yeah, Kilmer. Could, yeah, Val Kilmer. Yeah. Val Kilmer. You know, Jake worked on Val Kilmer's ranch. Really? Yeah. Did not know that. Yeah, you have to ask him about it sometime. Wow. I think he, like, they, like, subcontracted there, maybe, mm -hmm. and he worked there for a little bit, so he met Val Kilmer. Oh, wow. Because he has a ranch in New Mexico, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. 
when Jake was down. I think I, maybe Jake has mentioned that before, but he nailed it. He nailed that part. Yeah, that's a that's definitely my favorite movie. Yeah, Val. That's one of my all-time favorite movies is Tombstone. Mm -hmm. But also, Ghosts in the Darkness. Oh, he, Val Kilmer. He crushed killed it. it in that he movie. He crushed it in that, that movie. That movie, oh, the soundtrack. The and, soundtrack. And just, that's one of the things, like, having been to Africa, like, I, I can watch that movie and I can smell. I can smell that movie. Really? Oh, yeah. Africa has such a distinct smell. Have you ever been into the African bush? And you can like you know that smell and I watched that movie and it's just in the soundtrack I love music the soundtrack it's good oh it just yeah it it's moving so what's the smell <clears throat> dry leaves like fall dry leaves yes heat dry leaves wood smoke mmm it's um and then if you're in the villages the villages have a very distinct smell with all of the 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 humanity that's mostly unbathed mm -hmm. like just you, you just don't take showers yeah and um like that's a very distinctive smell the meat markets and like the it just it, i can smell it even watching that it's like i can I can hear the children laughing and I can hear the nighttime African bush. It's just like, it. oh, I just love that movie. And for people that haven't seen that movie, it's about these two lioness lions that kill. No, they were males. They were males? Yeah, they were in the Fields Museum in Chicago. Oh, they were, they're they, I they're believe males. they were brothers. Really? Yeah, males, male I brothers. they were females. But how many people did they kill? Like 250? Oh, a lot. Like they went a on lot. this killing streak. And, and the movie tells the story. Of, it's a true story. True story. It's crazy. Yeah. And then they had to hire that professional hunter to come yeah. in. And I don't know how accurate that was. Yeah. I, for you like know, the professional hunter and him. And they like tie up a donkey or something to get yeah, the first I'm going to actually look this up right now. See if there's a book on this. Yeah, great movie. Because that would be a, a really good read. A good read? Yeah. Hmm. I'm chewing this gum. I hope it's not. Hope y'all can't hear me I'm chewing on this gum. I wonder if this is based on a museum. I mean, a, a book. Dewey Graham, Google Books, right here. Let's see here. Huh. It looks like there is a book. Right on. No, I have to add no, it to the list. That's not it. I'll have to do a little more research but on it. But it is a good movie. Yeah, but I know they're in the Fields Museum in Chicago because... It mentions it, and I've read it somewhere, and the one time I drove through Chicago, I thought, I really would like to go to the Fields Museum, and I didn't, and then we got stuck in Chicago on a layover flying back from North Carolina once, and I thought about taking um, the hotel shuttle into downtown just to go down, <laughs> go there, but it was winter time, everything shut down, and I was just like, you know what, it's not worth it. Just to see the... Yeah, I just I wanted to go see the lines. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I've never seen a, you know, in zoos, but I haven't seen many lions. But at at Legends Ranch, they got a bunch of lions, like full body mount. You can just tell, like, you just wouldn't stand a chance against a lion yeah. with your bare hands. It's yeah. just like, come on, you better have something. Mm -hmm. You better be pretty fierce. But one thing I did want to ask you since we're having a chat, out of all the hunts that you've ever guided or personally hunted on, like what's what are some big ones for you that were like pretty epic? Epic? Yeah, it could have been your personal hunts. Oh, it could be gosh. hunts that you guided. <clears throat> um, and what made them epic? Was it, you know, was it the pack out that 
Because, you know, the pack out does add a lot to the hunt. I mean, I know it's a lot, like, to get in deep and... I mean, the pack out's a, an adventure in itself. Well, I think the first one, the it's second it. one that comes to mind, I don't want to talk about the first one. <laughs> it's my big bull. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it just... Um, just one of those things where doing the right thing is yeah. the hard thing. Yeah, totally, so, totally. Um, maybe that's another podcast one day. Yeah, we can add that in. <laughs> the second one that instantly came to mind. Sorry, and, I'm, in, and, I'm in late. He had a he, he killed a big bull a few years ago, and he had some circumstances that he had to to deal with, but. Did the right thing and did the right it, thing. It was it's hard. Not always easy. Yeah. But at the end of the day, he got a really good bull. Yeah, and it all worked out. So. Yeah. Um, I'm like thinking about some of them pack outs where we come back late. I, you know, I think. Man, I wish I still had the goat because it was hanging right over there a few weeks ago. And that, but the second thing that came to mind was. Um, Jimmy's goat hunt from last year. Oh. So we, we killed this goat. Sorry, I'm going to pull my ski boots off. I have new liners, wrap liners, and I'm molding them to my feet, and my feet are killing me right now. So I'm just going to slip these off. <clears throat> um, so we killed this goat. So how long will this take to break in before they're not killing your feet all day? It'll probably be January before I can be in these all day without loosening them up. So, Just the way it is. It is the way it is. It's, you know, to ski professionally, you got to have boots that kill your feet. So that hurt your feet, not kill your feet. So, but it makes it easier to ski more technical. Yeah, to, to work in them, you know. To work in them, it's you know. You gotta have the best. You gotta have the best. I was thinking about <clears throat> gear last night when we were packing out. So we were just on a hunt last night, and it, I, I don't know how many miles in we I, were, but it was a lot of elevation, and we were in deep to the point where I think we were about five miles in. But it was five miles and 2,000 feet elevation, so it was, we were deep. We were in there a ways. But what I was thinking to myself was how dangerous the backcountry can be when you don't have good gear. Yeah. And how essential good gear is. And, you know, I'm not a name brand, you got to have this just because yeah. it's the name brand. I'm more of a practical approach individual. You know, I, I want the best because it's the best, not yeah. just because somebody sees me wearing it. I want the best because I can go further and hunt harder yeah. because it allows me to. Absolutely. And like last night was a perfect example. You know, our water bottles are freezing, but we're layered up, you know, yeah. perfectly. Yeah, I was in my Kenai jacket and I was... We like, didn't even was, feel the cold and yeah. our water bottles are froze. Yeah. And I'm just thinking like, you can't you should not be in those situations if you don't have the right gear or a, a plan you know you just can't go as far or hunt as hard and you get so tired right like you hiked in that far and you're you know you're you're pushing your body to the limit and you want to be fresh because by the time we got in position like you know we had pushed it away because we had to crush it to get there in time yeah and then by the time we're there it's like you want to make sure your gear's not going to fail you. And then if we would have killed that bull yeah. last night, yeah, we would have been in for a long run. A long run. And then to add another, I mean, think about how heavy our packs were. And then to throw a quarter on. Even a front shoulder. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I was like, you know, by the time we got back to the truck, I was it, like, It would be one or two o'clock and we would have been carrying out My feet 80 were, pounds. I was already toast. On once we got back with nothing. Yeah. I mean, we would have done it. We would have just yeah. been slow. But that's, I mean, I've killed two bulls in that general area. And it's the same thing. It's like I was not out until 1 a.m. Yeah. And then you have to go back and 
repeat for two more days. Right. Because I was by myself, but, you know, even with friends coming in to help, it just, it's, it's a lot of work because you got so much elevation gain. And then I'm the kind of guy that's like, I'm going to take the neck meat. I'm going to, I'm going to take the rib meat. I'm going to like, I want every scrap of edible meat on that. And so it's a lot of work. Totally. So it's funny where your mind goes sometimes. Yeah. And uh, it's, e even to your sock, even yeah. down to what socks you have on make a difference. And yeah. I remember before we before we went up, I changed my socks. Yeah. Because I was like, I, I got to put these merino wool socks mm -hmm. on. And I'm so glad I did. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have good boots or good, you know, even if you have good boots and you put on some cotton socks and you're about to go hike. Or even, like, I have a pair of socks that I wear really only in the rifle seasons right and otherwise you're gonna be bl your feet are gonna be blistered yeah. now now because your feet hurt you're slipping more and you're like shying away from steps mm -hmm. and this just gets more dangerous because you know like there are some situations where if you would we would have slipped it would have been not good <laughs> you know and that almost makes it more fun like when we were hiking out and it was like moonlight we didn't use headlamps once last night Except for except for when we thought that mountain lion. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, look at the lion! There it is. <laughs> yeah, man, and you're like, oh there, my God. there he is, right there. I'm like, what, what? I, I did legit think I saw eyes too, but it was that snow. That snow was getting us out sparkles. That was weird. It was just too I'm like, man. I mean, that when, was like seeing the Marfa mystery lights. I was like, that's crazy. Like, there's a mountain lion. 30 feet away looking at us. <laughs> yeah, I felt even the close. I was like, dude, he's like right there. But but from seeing his tracks, it was like he's he's somewhere near us. Like those tracks were so fresh. Yeah, that cat that cat was looking at us. Yeah. He was somewhere. We didn't Oh crap. Full fridge. All right. Yeah, he was definitely somewhere close. He, those tracks were fresh, man. It was. I really didn't feel eerie, though. You know, I never felt like he's gonna pounce on us. But when you said you saw him, I did have a moment like, "All, all right, we got to do something about this." If there's a cat like right there, because where you saw, where you thought you saw him, it was like pouncing position. It's like he could definitely jump on us yeah in all, but all full that's weird it like it's not a mountain lion yeah i didn't have that hair raising you know yeah. walking in the woods sometimes yeah. and you just get that like but coming down though over there where we kept seeing those weird lights yeah i got a little wigged out in there like i got that little like man there's something weird about this those, hillside. those two lights were kind of weird yeah, I was. I like. I had one of those moments of like. I did see I it in the bottom, and it looked like a, a, like not quite a flashlight, but like a, I kept, like I thought I saw like, did like the moon reflect on something. What was that? Like a pinpoint light or something. Yeah, I was yeah. like, what is that? I've never seen anything seen like twice. that in the woods. I'm like, okay, this is really weird. And I'm trying to remember if I've ever felt that way on that hillside before. Yeah, I never. I didn't feel weird. I never felt weird, but I was just like, what was that? Well, you know, that story I was telling you about shed hunting, where I got cliffed out and yeah. I had to repeat like six miles in yeah. the dark, and then the storm came in. I, I do remember <clears throat> being uncomfortable on that hillside. Really? Yeah. Like, but, just like, just like something didn't feel right, uncomfortable, <clears throat> like that, like... Yeah. Like eerie, uncomfortable. Yeah, because I stopped and filled my water there in the snow melt. But I remember, like, I need to hurry up and finish this. It was really kind of strange. Yeah. And that is right where that lion came down, is off that hill. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know. I, you know, it's probably something bad happened on that hillside back in the native american days or something and you I think don't know. like 
that energy or that spirit level like hangs on that ridge still? Maybe. I mean, I've in Africa, some crazy oh, yeah, you stuff. Told, you told me about oh, yeah. that shaman. Yeah. Well, not it was one night. It's because I used to be a photojournalist, and I started because going to Africa and just taking a camera and just falling in love with storytelling and taking pictures. So I would go out and walk along the Kavango River. And this one day I went out, I don't know how many miles, I went out way far. By walking yourself. Through, by myself through all these villages. And I was staying with these Baptist missionaries and uh, I was miles away from the house, miles away. It's probably six plus miles. In seven, Africa. eight in Africa by myself. You know, and when you're 21, you're invincible. You think, man, I'm gonna go do whatever. And so I um was walking, and I'm like, I gotta turn around and walk back. And so I'm like, instead of walking along the river where there's like <clears throat> lions and alligator and crocodiles and you know, communist rebels still coming over the border from Angola. I'm like, I'm going to walk to this one town I know of and just walk the, the dirt road back into Rundu. And so that's what I do. And I walk through this little town, like a village, if you will. And it's dark. And it's dark. No, do you, and you got a headlamp. And I don't even have a headlamp. I'm just walking in the dark. Just a, a gringo American walking through the African countryside bush. Oh my and gosh, like, dude. I walked through this town and I swear it was like, it was the weirdest thing. I'm walking through the town. And it was like, as soon as I walked into, say, the city, the city limits, I mean, the village, it'd take you five minutes to walk through this little village. It's probably only about two dozen thatched stick buildings. But um, I walked through this little village, and it, it felt like somebody was sitting on me. Like, it's just this crazy spiritual oppression of, like, a heavy weight. And it was weird. As soon as I walk out of that town, it just went away. Whoa. That quick. Weird. And so I get back. And yet the, um, Dana, the, the wife of the family I was staying with, the you know the mom and the wife you know she was still up and she's like oh, I'm, you know I'm glad you're up and you know everybody else was in bed and she, she was up waiting for me and so I sit down and I think I was eating some chocolate cake she could make chocolate cake like nobody and you know I'm just eating this chocolate cake and I tell her my story and she's like oh my gosh the same thing happened to me tonight in the same town and because their houseworker lived in the next little village. And so um, Dana drove her home that night because she had stayed late. And they were really awesome. They were really about like employing local people and, you know, and just part of what they were trying to do in their ministry was, you know, reach out to so many people and employ people and you know so Dana drove her home that night because she usually would walk I mean they freaking walk everywhere over there in Africa but because it was late Dana's like look you're not walking home you're I'm gonna drive you because it's dark and so she drives her home and Dana's like the same thing happened to me driving it's same it, same thing happened to her she's like if I would have known you were in that town I would have been looking for you it, it was just the weirdest thing. It's like, man, you know. So, I, I, who knows what happened on that hillside? You know, it's maybe there's a like crazy battle a thousand years ago with some Native American tribes or something. Who knows? Yeah. You know, what's that? Yeah. That dark, you know? I mean, there's a reason why that movie we were talking about, The Ghost in the Darkness. Like, there is real darkness. Yeah. I believe. So. Yeah. 
who, you know, <coughs> to each their own. You can leave didn't, whatever you didn't, want. Didn't but. you say that a shaman came through and he disappeared as he walked away? When no. Was that you? That no, that, that wasn't that story? me. That's got to be somebody else. They were t they were telling me, and who was it? Somebody in Africa doing a mission trip, and this like shaman, you know, like you know how they have like shamans over yeah. there. Came into the town, and he was all upset about these missionaries being there, and he just turned and he walked away. And as he walked away, he disappeared, and he was just like some weird figure. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely. I've heard stuff yeah. like that in mm -hmm. Africa. Like, there's some definitely dark stuff going on yeah. over there. Yeah. But it's beautiful. Yeah. And the kids, most beautiful kids on the planet. Yeah. I mean, I've never seen kids smile like African kids. It's just, and my goodness. I mean, you walk into a church over there and you talk about, like, singing. It's just, it's... Like, not, they're holding nothing back. They're holding nothing back. And that's why I like that movie when they, you know, the soundtrack, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I, it's like revisiting. I, I would love to go back. <clears throat> but I don't know how we got on hey Africa. Hey guys, thanks um, for tuning in there for my discussion with Mountain Man Leche. Had a great talk, covered a bunch of different topics there. Leche is always good for a good conversation that leads all over the show. So, had an excellent hunt with Leche. Uh, got that all on camera. You'll have to stay tuned to see what happened with that one. And I appreciate you guys just listening to our discussion. Uh, stay tuned. There will be other discussions coming up with other hunters. Just talking about our adventures in the outdoors. Just love talking hunting and having good discussions like that. So, guys, I appreciate you. We'll see you on the next one.